Good morning and welcome to the 2019 Strategy Forum. I am Michael Nyberg, Chair of War Studies and proud member of Seminar 13. It is my honor to open this forum's first panel session on historical mindedness for strategists. As noted in your directive, the purpose of this panel is to further explore the uses of history in shaping the way that strategists think about the present and about the future. In short, if we are to think about anticipating the future, one tool we can use is to think about processes of change in the past. The format for the next hour and a half or so is as follows. I'll introduce, introduce both speakers now. Each speaker will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and for Q&A, so please be ready with good questions. A reminder that this panel is under the War College non-attribution policy, so please do not attribute any specific remarks here today to any specific individual. With that out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce two phenomenal scholars, authors, and good friends. Both are visiting us here in Carlisle for the first time. Our first speaker will be Dr. Frederick Logoval, who is the Lawrence B. Lawrence D. Belfer Professor of International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and Professor of History. Dr. Logoval is the author or editor of nine books, most famously probably The Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire, and The Making of America's Vietnam, which won the 2013 Pulitzer Prize for History, the 2013 Francis Parkman Prize, the 2013 American Library in Paris Book Award, and the 2013 Arthur Ross Book Award from the Council on Foreign Relations. And Fred was recently the president of the Society for the Historians of American Foreign Relations. After he speaks, Dr. Margaret McMillan will take the stage. She is professor of history at the University of Toronto, an emeritus professor of international history, and the former warden of St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford. Among her many distinguished books is Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, which earned her the honor of being the first woman to win the Samuel Johnson Prize, it also won the Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize and the Duff Cooper Prize. I have learned so much from both of these scholars and thinkers, and I know that you will too. Dr. Logoval, the floor is yours. Well, it's just an, <clears throat> it's just an honor to be with you, and I want to thank uh, uh, Mike for his, for his kind introductory words. I am really delighted to be here, and, and as was said, it's my first visit, and um, to have this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about history and policy, that's going to be my focus this morning, is a, is a thrill. The, the fellow who I guess you could say is my boss these days, or at least uh, he heads the center with, with, with which I'm affiliated at Harvard, is Ash Carter, and Ash Carter, as you know, was Secretary of Defense <clears throat> recently. He said this in a speech in 2018. So last year, he said, the dominant mental methodology of real policymakers is historical reasoning. The dominant mental methodology of real policymakers is historical reason, reasoning. It's not economics. It's not philosophy. It's not political science, but history. And I think it's a striking assertion but it's not, ladies and gentlemen, one that I think should surprise us when we think about it. After all, much of, thought, much of the thought that leads to decisions of policy is inevitably historical. Public decision in rational politics, we'll leave aside irrational politics for a moment, in rational politics necessarily implies a guess about the future derived from the experience of the past. It implies an expectation that certain actions tomorrow will produce the same sorts of results that they produced yesterday. Hence the importance, I'm going to argue this morning, hence the importance of policymakers having the capacity to think historically, to have a familiarity with the past, a feel for the rhythms and unpredictability of the past, a comfort with the long view. One of the themes this morning that I'm going to suggest is that it's not so much about specific historical knowledge, although of course that matters. Um, it's not so much about analogizing. In fact, analogizing can bring its own problems, but it's this broader sense, uh, a sense for unintended consequences, unpredictability, uh, a comfort with the long view, as I put it. So bear that in mind as I proceed. Bear Ash Carter's dictum in mind as I proceed. What I want to do this morning is begin with some broad points about 
the relationship between history and policy. Then I'll drill down a little bit, talk more specifically about what historians can bring to policymaking, uh, and maybe also what they can't bring, and then conclude with some, uh, zoom out again at the end with, for some broader comments. I'm teaching a course, by the way, this semester for the first time, a course at the Kennedy School, which is called Reasoning from the Past. Reasoning from the Past. So very much on the topic that we're discussing here this morning. We pay, we pay close attention in this class to analogies, to agency versus structure in history. We talk about counterfactual reasoning. I'm one of those academic historians who believe strongly in the utility of counterfactuals. And we can come back to that. Asking what if questions, I think, can have real uh, historical utility. Um, the issue of hindsight bias is something that we bring up in class, we talk about. By the way, I have in the class four or five national security fellows, as they're called. These are, these come to, they come to Harvard for a year from the uniformed military, and they are just superb in class. I want to tell you that um, the commandant referred to the importance of being open-minded, and what I love about our national security fellows, not just in this class, but more broadly, is that they bring that sense, that open-minded sense to the, to the discussion, and they are such an asset, not only in this class, but in, in others that um, I've had the pleasure of teaching and that my colleagues teach. By the way, it's the first time that I'm teaching this class, and the topic of the relationship between history and policy is one that, however, has long fascinated me, and so I'm glad to be teaching this class. Like a lot of academic historians, I'm skeptical, I regret to tell you this morning, I'm skeptical about the success of history as a means of prediction. Like many academic historians, I understand all too well, regrettably, that historical training confers no automatic wisdom in the realm of public affairs. And so for me, in part, in part, history is its own reward. And I study it for the intellectual and aesthetic fulfillment I find in the disciplined attempts to reconstruct and interpret the past, for the marvelous opportunity that history presents to consider man's capacity for heroism and foolishness. But that's not the only reason I do what I do. I also do, as a historian, see a utilitarian purpose in my work. A utilitarian purpose. To a degree, I want to suggest this morning, history can help us better understand the present and foresee the future. Why? Because history repeats itself enough to make at least some historical generalizations possible, and because generalization, sufficiently interconnected, can generate insight into the likely shape of things to come. Now, in saying this to you this morning, I'm on shaky ground with some fellow academic historians who would say, on the contrary, that history teaches nothing, who would say that for the historian, it's all about, and I think this here I'm quoting the great French historian Marc Bloch. Uh, Marc Bloch said, for the historian, it's all about the thrill of learning singular things. And I get that. Or consider A.J.P. Taylor, the great diplomatic historian of the middle part of the last century and men who like to provoke, by the way, so bear that in mind. But Taylor said this, men learn from their history, I'm sorry, men learn from their mistakes how to make new ones. In my opinion, we learn nothing from history except the infinite variety of men's behavior. We study it as we listen to music, A.J.B. Taylor. Now, Taylor, as I said, liked to provoke, and in fact, if you read Taylor's actual work, his own work, uh, it suggests something other than what he says here. In other words, I think he, he definitely believed that one could learn from history, that history taught, if not lessons, it taught certainly things that were useful to present-day policymakers. Um, but I don't buy this argument. I guess the point I'm making is I don't buy this argument that we cannot learn very important things from history. It seems silly to me to insist that no generalization is possible, to insist upon the absolute uniqueness of, of events in history is nonsense, in my judgment. I suspect also that deep down most historians agree with me on this. Most historians are prepared to acknowledge tendencies, patterns, 
Most, I think, accept the proposition that historical generalizations in a number of areas can serve to enlarge the wisdom of the policymaker, giving perspective and depth to her responses to the crises of the moment, giving her an instinct for the direction and flow of events. The result is historical insight, historical insight, a sense of what is possible and probable in human affairs derived from a feeling for the continuities and discontinuities of existence. We can call that historical sensibility. And my friend Frank Gavin, who teaches at Seiss Johns Hopkins, has defined historical sensibility in the following way. And I'll quote it briefly, because I kind of like this definition. Historical sensibility, he says, is a, fam a famil familiarity with the past and its powerful and often unpredictable rhythms. A historical sensibility is less a method than a practice, a mental awareness, discernment, responsiveness to the past, and how it unfolded into our present world. And I continue. Developing this sensibility can provide many benefits and insights to the decision maker facing complex issues and radical uncertainty about the future, not least, Gavin concludes in this definition, not least of which is humility and prudence. So central for him and for me is this idea that historical sensibility is in part about humility and prudence. Elliot Cohen, who I think you've read or will be reading, some of you, calls this a historical mind, which I think is pretty much the same thing. I think that Eliot, uh, Eliot would define it quite in a quite similar way to, to the way I've just done it here. And let me give you a historical example. So I'm writing at the moment a biography, a life and times as they call it, two volumes. It's going to be one, but now it's two. Funny how these things happen, but it won't be three, I promise. Uh, a two-volume biography of John F. Kennedy. Uh, so it's a life and times of our 35th president. And John F. Kennedy, one of the themes in this book, especially evident, I think, in volume two, which will, be, which will, which will cover the, the campaign, the presidency, and his death, uh, John F. Kennedy had a historical sensibility. And it, it comes out very clearly in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, another feature, it seems to me, of a historical sensibility is empathy. And I was actually toying this morning when I was, when I was thinking about what I was going to tell you or talk to you about. I was thinking about emphasizing empathy and its importance uh, to a policymaker. Uh, but I'll simply say here that in the non, shall we say, the successful resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy, at a key moment, was able to empathize. That is, that is, he was able to put himself into the shoes of his adversary, Nikita Khrushchev. And Khrushchev, I think, was also able to empathize with Kennedy. I think it went both ways in a way that proved to be very important. Kennedy had also read Barbara Tuckman's classic work on the origins of, of, of World War I shortly before the missile crisis. That, I think, informed his decision-making during the 13 days. But there are lots of examples in Kennedy's life, going back to his own experience in the South Pacific, which I write about a lot in volume one, that I think inculcated in him, gave him this uh, historical mind, as Eliot Cohen puts it, uh, and uh, this historical sensibility. Let me drill down a little bit, second part of my presentation. So far, I've spoken in general terms, but what about the direct connection between history and policy, historians and policy. I wanted to say a little bit about that this morning. Um, maybe a definition of policy is in order first so that we are all on the same page. We can simply say this. Policy is a plan by which leaders hope to influence the outcome of one or another process in the future. Um, a plan by which leaders hope to influence the outcome of one or another process in the future. So policy, by definition, constitutes a strategy, a comprehensive design to bring about certain future outcomes as against other possible future outcomes. Or we could say this, policy is a calculated course of action intended to shape future history, a scheme by which we hope to achieve desirable continuities and changes at a future time. 
Now, as I said at the outset, a pol the policymaker, unless he's some kind of historical nihilist, which I suppose can happen, the policymaker has no alternative but to make use of historical information uh, and historical thought, simply because he or she is specifically concerned with processes, the bread and butter of historians. That is to say, policymakers consider plans for influence future processes by references to a comprehensive or to, to, to understanding past processes. History provides much of the data and the ways of thinking available to those interested in shaping the futurist process. I think this is the point that Ash Carter is making when he says that history is the dominant mental methodology of real policymakers. So to whom, here's the question, to whom do policymakers go for their history? Well, very often not to historians. They instead depend on their own historical resources, often is insufficiently developed, or on those uh, dedicated but ill-informed advisors. So the question for us this morning is, what can historians bring? Well, I'm going to list just a few things. First, historians can provide, it seems to me, the best possible version of recent history which I think is the history most likely to, be in, to influence uh, people in public life. And here's, by the way, I'll just say parenthetically, is a, is a potential problem because there is a bias in the profession, in the historical profession, there is a bias against contemporary history. And so that potentially leaves the field to non-specialists and EGAD political scientists, journalists, um, but, but historians can, it seems to me, provide the best possible interpretation of the recent past. That's number one. Number two, even with my earlier comment about the perils of prediction, it may be, and I underscore may, it may be that historians are better placed than others to offer insights into the future, into the likely course of events. For in a sense, you could say that we historians predict backward. We predict backwards, so we may have a better sense. I'll leave it at that to see, to give a sense of how things are likely to play out. Ernest May, my former colleague, and a great influence on me intellectually, my late colleague, Ernest May has noted um, that historians construct hypotheses about the forces that produce change or continuity in some past period. In the process, according to Ernest, Historians may develop skills at least in identifying questions to be asked by those ahead. To put it differently, forecasting is not merely a projection, it involves judgment. Third point, third thing that historians can bring. <clears throat> it's an integrative discipline history, more so I think than many other disciplines. The historian's grasp is eclectic. The history discipline is inherently holistic and better nurtures the contextual perspective, which is so often defeated by the training, I regret to say, the contextual perspective that is often defeated by the training of the economist or the psychologist. So there's, it's a more of an integrative discipline that can help, it seems to me. We can pursue these things further uh, later if anybody wants to discuss them in greater detail. Fourth, fourth thing historians bring. Historians in policymaking situations offer a hedge against the biases of other social scientists or of social scientists. Economists, for example, tend to set policy by averages, not by exceptions. But history never repeats itself exactly, and the historian is best equipped to point this out. Fifth, uh, and finally, given the pervasive, pervasiveness of analogizing, this is something that we all do, and this is something, by the way, in my class, we're delving into in depth. Why do we analogize? How can we analogize better? Given the pervasiveness of analogizing, historians can help weed out the worst of them. It is just as important for policymakers to know the difference between good and bad historical analogies. Think about this. Just as important for, for policymakers to know the difference between good and bad historical analogies as it is to know the difference between good and bad statistics. And by the way, my, my colleagues, Graham Allison and Neil Ferguson, um, 
have proposed the creation in the White House of a Council of Historical Advisors. That would be akin to the Council of Economic Advisors. But what Graham and Neil have argued uh, is for, for a small council that would, that would exist in the White House and provide some of the benefits that I've just laid out. We can talk further. I have uh, some reservations about such a council, as I've said to them both. And I'll have an opportunity to say to them actually this evening back in Cambridge. But we can talk further about the council uh, if anybody wishes to do so. So what are the counter arguments? <clears throat> the counter arguments against involving historians directly in the policy making process. In order to be fair, I think I need to at least consider such counter arguments. They often come from historians themselves, by the way. And I'll just list them uh, briefly. There is an argument, for example, that historians surrender perspective by moving from the past to current issues, and they run the risk of losing their intellectual independence by developing a stake in how their conclusions are used. One uh, notable historian, Samuel Hayes of the University of Pittsburgh, put it like this. You can make a big contribution to how people think by writing history, but you can't do this if you commit yourself to a given policy position. That's Hayes. If you bring bad news, you may get the ex to, to experience the meaning of the phrase, shoot the messenger. You'll be expected to get on the team. Uh, Irving Janus uh, talked, obviously, about the, the concept of groupthink that can become a, a problem for historians, I think is what Hayes is suggesting. In other words, historians cannot themselves e escape the political. And for practitioners of public history to be engaged, or, 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 or history in general to be engaged in advising policymakers, does not render policy more historical, but rather, re, but rather renders history more political. Another problem. <clears throat> the applied historian will want to correct or, or qualify overconfident social scientific assertions or politicians' simplistic assumptions by offering the historian's standard assertion, which is something like this. Actually, Mr. President, it's rather more complicated than that. It's more complicated. The problem is that this is hard. Those historians who have been involved in policymaking or advising know this all too well. It's hard in a setting in which the pressure is on to hurry, to simplify, to condense. It goes against all their training, which is toward the complex, toward reconsidering and stretching out nets of qualification. Here's what one business executive had to say. When I have a problem, I want it addressed. Historians bleed too much. So this is a challenge. How to provide anything resembling the sort of practical policy advice that politicians or civil service servants will ever take seriously. One final reservation, and then I'm going to offer a few concluding remarks and uh, turn it over to Margaret. <clears throat> Another reason to be skeptical, perhaps, about what historians can bring. How often is policy failure the result of a lack of information as opposed to other causes? A lack of relevant information is rarely, one could argue, if ever a proximate cause of foreign policy failure, or domestic policy for that matter. Foreign policymakers are more likely to be inundated with information and competing viewpoints, but parse such information based on their own preconceived notions and interests than they are to miss the information completely. So just a very quick example, one that I know well, Vietnam 1965. It's in fact the case, I believe, on the basis of my uh, research in several different publications, it is the case that USC policymakers did not really suffer from inadequate knowledge of South Vietnamese weaknesses or North Vietnamese or Viet Cong uh, determination. In fact, most senior officials, including Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, Robert McNamara, McNamara maybe even more, were all too aware of these weaknesses, all too aware of the adversary's determination. They had a deep sense of the obstacles ahead, and they knew of the historic Vietnamese opposition to domination to external forces. That is a uh, a, a factor that we should delve into further. Um, 
I have more I can say there, but let me finish briefly with a few broad observations. Think again Ash, of Ash Carter's dictum, the dominant mental methodology of real policymaker is, is historical reasoning, not economics, political science, or philosophy. I agree with this. And Ash, by the way, is in a position to know, having held most positions in the Pentagon over his career. I want to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by suggesting that historical study can serve as an antidote to the misuse of past episodes by our leaders. It can save us from being victimized by analogies, by the easy, quote, lessons of the past, unquote. It's important that our leaders use history and intelligence with wisdom, with, with, with intelligence and wisdom, which means that the rest of us, too, have to use it with intelligence and wisdom. For us, as for them, the antidote to a shallow knowledge of history is a deeper knowledge, the knowledge that produces not dogmatic certitude, but diagnostic skill, not clairvoyance, but insight. Historical study, I want to suggest, should make us less egocentric, revealing how other humans have confronted similar problems in other times. It should expand our reservoir of experience, and as such, enhance freedom stimulating creative imagination, lifting the bonds of time and place, thus suggesting larger possibilities for action. On a societal level, history should assist us by enabling us to ex escape short-range perspectives, to understand better the origins of the present, and in that way should aid, should aid, in the creation of a more intelligent future. Never merely a book to be consulted, historical study is a process, process of entering into the past a process that is often as important as the information we learn. And in this way, historical study should pull us away from self-centeredness and make us more aware of the likely results of our actions, a necessary first step in the development of maturity and wisdom. This, I think, is a historical sensibility. I'll conclude with a quote by R.G. Collingwood, philosopher of history. I very much like this This. Quote, Collingwood writes, knowing yourself means knowing what you can do. And since nobody knows what he can do until he tries, the only way to know what man can do is to know what man has done. The value of history, then, is that it teaches us what man has done and thus what man is. And I thank you. Thank you very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I could give a very short talk and say I agree with everything Fred says and sit down, but um, I think Michael might not approve of that, so I, I, will, I would like to add um, to what he said. And I want to talk particularly about how hist history can help in thinking about strategy. Strategy itself, <coughs> excuse me, is a very difficult word much overused, much expanded. When you see books in bookstores, um, my strategy for losing weight, my strategy for getting rich, my strategy for doing such and such, you know that the word is beginning to lose meaning. What I want to do is go back to the meaning of strategy in military affairs, and that is how a people, an organized people, an organized force, a country, carry out what it is they want to carry out. How do they defend themselves? How do they project their power? How do they deal with the changing conditions in the world? How do they make happen what they want to happen? And so strategy, I think, is policy, but it's more than policy. It, how do you get that policy to do what you want? And strategy must take into account, of course, the group that's trying to do something, its geography, its resources, its goals, its values, what it wants to protect or what it wants to promote. But strategy also has to deal with the other, because strategy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has to deal with the reactions and capacities of those it is going to interact with. It has to know the enemy. It has to know what the enemy can do, what the enemy might do. And therefore, strategy is not something, in my view, that is static. It is constantly changing and adapting, because that's what it must do. It must be carrying out 
particular policies and particular goals, but always in a context where others are trying to carry out their policies and their goals. And I think history can, as Professor Lagerfeld has said so eloquently, history can help us do it and can help those who are having to make the policies and create the strategies and adapt the strategies in the face of changing circumstances. History can help us with that. It can help us because it reminds us over and over again of the role of contingency, things just happening to happen at the same times. It can remind us of change and how change can affect our capacities to do what we want to do. And it can remind us of sheer chance, of sheer accident. I think it's perfectly possible to argue that the First World War would not have broken out in the summer of 1914 if the driver of the Archduke's car hadn't made the wrong turning and been unable to back up quickly enough. And so accidents do happen in history. A.J.P. Taylor, who, who Professor Lagerwald just quoted, said once that we tend to think that great events have great causes. He said sometimes they start just by accident. And history can remind us of these things. What it also does is challenge our assumptions. And challenging our assumptions is an important part of what it means to think constructively and creatively about the world and what we must do. If we don't know the questions to ask, then we're not going to have a hope of finding any answers. And so I'd like to talk about some of the ways in which, as people have to think of strategy, about how they carry out a particular policy or set of policies, and how they deal with the unforeseen and the unexpected and the other, I'd like to suggest ways in which history can help in the thinking. And many of these will echo what Fred Lagerwald has, has just said. I think one of the most important things history does as we think about the world is help us to understand ourselves and understand others. We often don't understand ourselves very well. We, we assume we know ourselves because we just simply take it for granted that we are who we are. And what we need to understand about ourselves is sometimes we tell ourselves things which are partial or not entirely true or which others may not fully grasp about us. And so Americans, I think, I speak as a Canadian, Americans often tell themselves that they have never been a menace to their neighbors. They have always been friendly and they've always been good neighbors. Well, if you're Canadian or Mexican, you may have a different view on that. And it's just worth remembering that others do not always see you in the way you see yourselves. Uh, Canadians, if I'm gonna say something about Americans, I should say something about Canadians. We tell ourselves that we're a very gentle and peace-loving and tolerant people. All I need to say to you on that is watch a Canadian hockey game sometime. <laughs> I think we also need to understand how others are likely to behave and how others are likely to behave will be how are we are likely to behave. We are all created by our histories. Individuals, groups, we're created by the worlds into which we were born, the class into which we were born, the geography into which we were born, the religion into which we were born, the things that have happened to us. Those have gone into making us who we are. We are more than that, of course, but we are very much the products of our history. And all of us in this room are products of different histories, and we're interacting with people who have histories that are different from us. And I think unless we understand that, we're not going to be able to deal with each other. It's impossible, I think, to understand the long-running conflict between Palestinians and Israelis unless you understand the history, unless you understand what both sides are remembering because the Palestinians will look at events that they share with Israelis in a very different way. And the Israelis will look at those events in a very different way. And I think there will be no hope of coming to any sort of understanding between peoples who are locked into those sort of struggles unless each remembers and understands what it is the other has been formed by and is remembering. Too often, I think, we tend to assume that people are just like us. And that does lead, as we have known, into trouble. I think it's very striking, and I think the military, I think, often realize this more acutely than most others because they have to deal with others. Too often, I think, we have seen military planners go into situations without truly understanding what this context is going to be like and what the enemy is going to be like. I found it striking and impressive that when the coalition forces went into Iraq at the beginning of the 21st century, a lot of the generals sent back for copies of T.E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom as they began to encounter resistance from the Iraqis. They made, I think, a very 
important attempt to try and understand what it was that motivated the Iraqis, what divided the Iraqis, how they were reacting to outsiders. I myself don't think The Seven Pillars of Wisdom was the best book. I think there were other books that could have helped more, but I think the military understood that unless they had a grasp of what motivated and what drove the people they were dealing with, they were not going to have much hope of building a successful and peaceful Iraq. I think the same thing was true in Afghanistan, that understanding the nature of Afghan society and understanding what it is that has shaped the Afghan people themselves is hugely important if any country is going to go in and deal with it. Um, there was an English theater group called the Tricycle Company, quite radical, quite left-wing, but did a series of plays which dealt with Afghanistan. And Sir David Richards and the general staff of the British Army actually went to a performance of the, of the Tricycle Company. It must have been a rather odd encounter, I think, this rather left-wing radical theater group and, and the top British military brass. But what Richards said, and I find this interesting, he said, if I'd seen the plays before being deployed to Afghanistan for the first time in 2005, it would have made me a much better commander. Seeing the sweep of history in an afternoon gives a perspective that isn't easy to achieve from reading reports or watching the news. And so I think the military perhaps understand because it is so important just how important history can be. What history also does, I think, is open up our minds, and again, this is, I think, extremely important for the military, to possibilities, to the possibility that things may not turn out the way you, you want it to. It's, it's what Fred Lagerval was talking about in the historical sensibility, that sense that you have to be open to possibilities that things aren't going to go necessarily the way you hope they will go. General Petraeus, one of your great generals, said, experience has taught me that insightful military leaders are those whose education and interests are grounded not only in military and political studies, but also informed by the arts and the humanities. And of course, that includes, I think, very much, and I think in his mind, history. History also can remind us. It reminds us that what we think is normal, what we think is going to continue in the present into the future, may not be the only possibility. We all make assumptions. It's the only way in which we can get on with our daily lives. But we assume that what we see now is probably going to be what is there in 10 years or 20 years. Let me just give a couple of examples of what I mean. We assume that Germany is firmly locked into the Western alliance. And that, I think, is a very sensible assumption. And all recent history bears that out. Germany has been key in NATO. But I think we need always to remember that Germany has always faced both East and West, and that there have been periods in the past where Germany's had very close relations with Russia, and it is deeply embedded in relations with the countries to the East of it. And that's not to say that Germany is at any conceivable time going to suddenly turn its back on the Western alliance, but we need to remember that Germany has different links and a different past and different relationships with its neighbors than countries further afield might have. We tend to assume that China and Japan are likely to be unfriendly to each other because of the more recent history. But if we go further back, China and Japan have had a long and often fruitful relationship. And there have always been those, and there were those in the 20s and 30s, and probably those today who have argued that a very natural alliance is between China and Japan, that you have an enormous land mass with an enormous population, and then you have a very dynamic economy on a set of very powerful islands. Now, this is not to say that we're going to see realignments in the world, but we need to keep our minds open to the possibilities that these can happen. I think what history can also do is help us identify challenges that we face at any moment in any time of history. We know, I think, increasingly that periods of transition in world power can be difficult, and these pose real problems for those who would make strategy. When you have a shift in the balance of power that can lead, as it has led before, to tensions. And so before the First World War, we had a declining hegemonic power, the British Empire, which had, for better or worse, dominated the world for much of the 19th century and had, in a way, acted as the world's policeman, keeping the world's waterways free for trade and for the movement of its own trade and its own troops around the world. But Britain was falling behind slowly, but it was beginning to fall behind in industrial production. It was overstretched. Paul Kennedy, the, the great 
historian at Yale pointed this out. He said empires get into a position where they stretch too much. He called it imperial overstretch. They can't maintain the burden of running an increasingly far-flung and often difficult empire. And the British were aware that they faced challenges, challenges they were no longer sure they could deal with. They faced a challenge from a rising United States, which towards the end of the 19th century was beginning, only beginning, but beginning the process of translating its very real economic and demographic and geographic power into military power. And they faced possible conflict with the United States in the New World. In the 1890s, there was talk of war in both capitals, in both Washington and London, of possible war between the United States and Britain. And calmer heads luckily prevailed and, and an arrangement was made. But Britain was also being challenged by a rising Japan in the Far East, which was becoming a very significant industrial and naval power and military power. And it was being challenged increasingly closer to home by Germany, which was challenging Britain economically, but then in what in retrospect was, I think, a very foolish move, decided to challenge Britain in terms of naval power as well. The German Kaiser, and his advisors, Admiral Tirpitz among them, decided that Germany would build a high seas navy. Um, the unkind explanation for this is that when the Kaiser was a little boy, he used to visit his grandmother, Queen Victoria, at Sandringham on the Isle of Wight, and he used to see the great naval reviews. And he said, I want one of those when I grow up. The less unkind explanation is that there were a large number of Germans who felt that Germany as a great power should have a great navy. It was simply assumed that great powers had great navies and, and had empires. But by challenging Britain, the Germans put real pressure on a Britain that was already feeling overstretched. In the end, the British came to terms with the United States, made a treaty with Japan, and outbuilt the German navy so that by 1914, the British navy still was supreme and the German Navy had not managed to overtake it. But those tensions between rising and declining powers produced circumstances before the First World War where there was talk of war and certainly contributed to the outbreak of the war as it broke out in 1914. We know that rising powers, Germany was an example and the United States in its time was an example, push against hegemonic powers because they feel they are not getting their fair share. They're not getting, as the Germans used to say, their place in the sun. And we're seeing this today with rising powers. We're seeing a China which feels that it is not being taken seriously enough, that its power is not being respected enough, which is impatient of those who say, wait. I think we see a China that is increasingly willing to push against what it sees as an existing world order. And that is potentially destabilizing, and I think that is where history can help us to think about how to manage those situations. And there are always alternatives, but history can open our minds to the alternatives. The alternatives in the US-China relationship range from outright military confrontation, which certainly there is talk of, but also can range to the other extreme where the two parties come to some sort of agreement as Britain, the British Empire, and the United States did in the 1890s. We also see in history the dangers of powers that feel themselves to be declining. The British manage their decline, at least they manage it quite well until the present day. Um, Brexit seems to be a very odd sort of moment where they're, they're not managing their decline well. But I think we see in Russia a really difficult situation, a power that knows it's declining. But Vladimir Putin is presiding over a country which is suffering a demographic loss, Russian population is going down, the Russian life expectancy is going down, the Russian economy is not producing for the people of Russia, it relies very heavily on resource extraction, it has not managed to modernize itself, yet he is using his considerable power to cause trouble elsewhere. He can't take on directly a power such as the United States, he probably couldn't even take on NATO and he certainly could not take on China, but what he can do is cause trouble so that Russia is still counts, that Russia is still respected. And this again is something that history can help us at least to watch out for and at least to understand. A further thing I think that history can do is warn us that when nations become suspicious of each other, that can in itself become a self-perpetuating cycle. That once you begin to be suspicious of the intentions and motives of another people, of another nation, pretty much everything that other people and nation does begins to feed into that. 
Before 1914, as the crisis unfolded in 1914, before the war broke out, the German high command, which was already very apprehensive about growing Russian power, began to look at what Russia was doing in response to the crisis, and everything Russia seemed to do struck the Germans as preparing for war. And so when the Germans asked their military attaches to see if there were any signs of Russia mobilizing without making any public announcement of it, the German military attaches reported they couldn't see any signs of this, and the Germans back in Berlin concluded this was because the Russians were hiding it. Once you get into a frame of mind where you suspect that the other side is up to no good, then you will uh, manage to feed every bit of evidence in, even if it, it is contradictory. And so history does, I think, offer useful precedents, possibilities, opens our minds, but it does offer these sorts of warnings. It offers, well, so many warnings. It offers warnings about how peoples can get caught in assumptions in the period before the First World War, Europe's military were planning for decisive battles. They assumed that wars had to be determined by decisive battles. They didn't look at the many wars that have in fact been determined by attrition. They were looking for the decisive battle, the Battle of Waterloo, the Battle of Cannae, the Battle of Austerlitz, these decisive battles which seemed to determine things. Well, in fact, the Battle of Cannae in the Punic Wars did not result in a Carthaginian victory. Rome, in the end, won through attrition. And that's, I think, very important to remember. The Battle of Waterloo happened when Napoleon's France had already been so ground down by the Allied war that it was no longer really capable of fighting on. It happened at the end of a long period of attrition. But before 1914, every major European war power had offensive war plans. None of them, by 1914, had defensive plans. The last defensive plan that Russia had had, and, and if any country should fight a defensive war, it was Russia, given its space and, and given the difficulties of moving into Russia. Russia had abandoned its last defensive plan in 1912. And so every European power was searching for the decisive victory, the decisive battle. What they were doing was ignoring the evidence, and the evidence was there, that war increasingly was becoming defensive. Changes in technology, the use of rapid firing artillery, the use of rapid firing guns, the appearance of the machine gun, barbed wire, trenches, I mean, you know all of the, all of the technology that was appearing, meant that it was increasingly difficult to attack well-defended positions. And there was plenty of evidence of this. The American Civil War offered all sorts of evidence that people who were dug in in strongly defended positions inflicted hideous losses on those who were trying to attack them. The Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905 showed again what happened when soldiers, no matter how brave, no matter how numerous, no matter how well prepared, tried to attack well defended positions. The wars in the Balkans, the two wars in the Balkans in 1912 and 1913 showed exactly the same thing. The military explained them away. I think a lot of the military knew that something significant had changed in warfare, but they chose to explain them away. They said of the American Civil War, these were the Europeans, well, it was the Americans fighting, and it was a civil war. It doesn't count. It wasn't professional European armies. They said of the Russo-Japanese War, well, in the end, the Japanese won, and it showed that the Japanese were able to take those sorts of losses. And so what we must do said European military planners, is we must train the soldiers psychologically so that they, they will be prepared to die in large numbers. Instead of changing our tactics and our strategy in response to the new technology, we will change human nature. And so a great deal of the emphasis in the training in the European military academies and officer training schools before 1914 was psychological. How to persuade people to go out into a killing zone often a 1,000 yards or more long, how to persuade them to go out and attack well-defended positions, knowing that they're going to take hideous losses. And so our capacity to explain things away and to ignore things that are inconvenient is huge, and we need to remember that. We all get caught in assumptions. We get caught in assumptions about what the war is going to look like. After the First World War, as, as I'm sure you know, the French assumed that the next war would be a defensive war again, like the First World War had turned into. And so they invested huge amounts of money in a very strong defensive position. You can still see it in France. It was built to last, I think, forever. The Maginot Line, it became the pride and joy of France 
French engineering, French technology, French soldiers were poured, poured into the Maginot Line. In the end, the Germans flew over it and went around the end, and it turned out not to be worth what had been spent on it. So often, I think, we make assumptions. We also make assumptions about those we're going to be fighting. Robert McNamara said, and of course he spent a lot of time thinking about what had gone wrong in Vietnam, and he said, in retrospect, we viewed the people and leaders of South Vietnam in terms, terms of our own experience. We saw in them a thirst for and a determination to fight for freedom and democracy. And we went, he went on, we assumed that the pain and the cost of the war would get to be too much for North Vietnam. And then, I'll quote him again, our misjudgments of friend and foe alike reflected our profound ignorance of the history, culture, and politics of the people in the area and the personalities and habits of their leaders. And so I think when you get people who have actually experienced war saying this, I think it is perhaps the strongest evidence that they feel that something can be gained from history. We don't always learn from failure either. We don't learn necessarily how to adapt our strategies so that we will avoid failure in the future. Both the French and the Americans went into Indochina assuming that their advantages in conventional war and their superior technology and economies would crush North Vietnam. The French lost after the dreadful battle at Dien Bien Phu, and the Americans eventually decided the cost was too high for them. They'd never lost militarily, but I think they lost politically. Neither the French nor the Americans really wanted to think about why they had lost. That war, those wars were not studied. They were regarded as aberrations, as something that had taken both the French forces and the American forces away from what was their true mission to fight more conventional sorts of war. And when the American forces, and again, I don't need to tell you, um, but when they decided that they were going to have to fight counterinsurgency again, they basically had to relearn a lot, a lot of what they had learned in Vietnam. I think I'm right that the leading manual on counterinsurgency warfare that had been used during the Vietnam War was allowed to go out of print after the end of that war until, of course, counterinsurgency became an issue again in the 2000s. Fred Lagerfeld has talked a bit about how we use analogies in war, and so I just want to add a bit to that because we do have to have some way of sorting through huge amounts of information. I mean, we're all bombarded the whole time with enormous amounts of information, so how do we actually try and assess situations? And what we do is we often draw on the past, whether or not we realize it, and we say, well, this situation is a bit like something that happened to me or something that happened to my country or something that happened to my armed forces 20 years ago. And let's see how we can use that previous experience and, and apply it to the present. And of course it can be very useful. It can be very helpful if we say, yes, there are certain characteristics in the present that we can see in the past. And let's see what happened in the past. And let's see who dealt successfully with that situation and, and, and who didn't. Where analogies can become dangerous is when they become a trap, when you only use one analogy. One analogy, which in my view has been used far too much in strategic thinking, is the analogy of appeasement that you, 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 I'm sure you all know it, but that briefly, in the 1930s, the democracies compromised too much with the dictators, with particular Nazi Germany, with fascist Italy, and with an increasingly militaristic Japan, and that it conceded their demands too easily when they could have stopped them. The classic example is that Hitler moved troops into the Rhineland, a part of Germany, but in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, in the middle of the 1930s, at a time when the German army was very weak, and his own generals were terrified of what the Allies might do. And the argument that has been made then and since is if the French and the Belgians and the British had moved then in the middle of the 1930s, they could have stopped Hitler, and he might well have been overthrown by his own generals. And history would indeed have been different. Instead, what the democracies did is concede again and again. They allowed Japan to take Manchuria without doing much more than, than condemn it in a, few, in a, in a, in a series of, of words. They allowed Mussolini to go into Ethiopia, again, without doing much more than, than imposing a few rather weak sanctions. I think for a while, Italians were not able to buy French champagne, which may, may have been a terrible blow, but didn't, wasn't going to stop the Italian <laughs> war effort. They allowed Hitler to take over Austria, and they allowed Hitler to take 
most of the Czech, uh, mo most of, the, of the, the, the Western part of Czechoslovakia, again, without a shot being fired. And the argument is that appeasement was a disaster. The trouble with the appeasement analogy is it has been applied wildly inappropriately to all sorts of situations. The British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, applied it to Egypt and Gamal Abdel Nasser, the di dictator of Egypt in the 1950s. He had dealt with Mussolini and Hitler, and he said, Nasser is simply another Hitler and another Mussolini, and he has to be stopped now. And the British, as a result, colluded with the French and the Israelis to try and seize the Suez Canal, and it was a catastrophe. And it caused a damage to British prestige. It caused a rift with the United States, which was going to take some time to heal. The, the appeasement analogy was used, of course, in Vietnam in the year of 1965 when there was a debate about escalation and how much to escalate in Vietnam. The appeasement analogy was used a lot in Washington. And one counter analogy was used. George Ball, who knew a lot about Asia in the State Department, said, yes, the appeasement analogy is there. But he said there is another analogy. He said to his colleagues, we should be looking at what happened to the French when they fought North Vietnam and the Vietnamese. And he was, his analogy was dismissed. People said, no, that isn't relevant. Um, we won't make the same mistakes as the French. And so you have to be careful with your analogies, and you have to keep your mind open and not get trapped in your analogies. And so in the end, I think what I say that history can do for strategy is very much like what Fred Lagavella said. It can help us to think. It can help us to understand. It can help us to ask questions. It should help us to avoid mistakes. We don't have much other way of reading the future, but history at least can warn us what pitfalls there might be. John Lewis Gaddis, the great American historian at Yale, once said that history is rather like signs on the road. You'll see a sign as you're driving along saying, be careful, bad curve ahead. And I think that's what history can do. And finally, and I think this is actually very useful, history can teach us a bit of humility. It can remind us that people in the past who had many sources of information, a great deal of power, who were often very clever, who had very clever advisors, made really huge mistakes. And I don't think humility and a willingness to understand that human beings can make mistakes is a bad thing as you try and deal with very difficult situations. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, as you're all organizing your thoughts and getting your questions ready, I'm going to take uh, speaker's prerogative and ask the first question. Uh, both of you spoke about analogies. I wonder if you could maybe add one or two thoughts on that if we're taking a situation that is, I think for most of us, pretty unfamiliar, Iran or North Korea, a place we don't know very much about. How would you recommend organizing your thoughts using a method of analogy to a crisis in an area that may not be quite so familiar to your own mindset? Well, what I would do is look at what has happened to that country or that people before when they have had to deal with outside forces. You know, take Iraq. Um, you know, if you had studied, anyone who has studied the history of Iraq and, and the British attempt to, uh, when the country was set up, after the First World War, the British became its mandatory power and uh, tried to run it. And the Iraqis didn't like it. Um, the British had to deal with a widespread revolt, which actually cost them quite a lot of popular support. They ended up spending far more money than they thought they were going to spend. And what they were dealing with was a populace that had its own sense of what it was, which may have been divided, but also had a sense of an Iraqi nationalism and which suspected, with some reason, the British wanted to get their hands on Iraqi oil and on Iraqi resources. And so the experience of the British, it seems to me, would give warning to anyone who wants to come into Iraq. They should be aware that this is likely to be the reaction. Yeah, I would just add to, to, to what Margaret is saying, that it's, it's, it's challenging. I think this has been one of the interesting things about teaching this class, is that we're, we're coming to see, I think, in the class that Analogies, analogies are tricky because you face you face as a historian and as a student of, of of say military history, a conundrum. 
or, or a, a challenge in trying to explain this using analogies, is the analogy really the source of the policy, or at least a source of the policy, or is it an ex post facto justification for policy enacted for other, other reasons? That can be tricky. So is it in fact the case that Munich, to go to Professor McMillan's great example, uh, drove the decision to escalate the war in Vietnam, for example? Or was it the case that Johnson and others said, we're doing this because if we don't do this, then we're gonna be guilty of appeasement again in Southeast Asia, the communists are gonna be on the march, the dominoes will fall. That's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. It's not, I think, directly responding to Mike's question, but it's a, 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 it's a, a, a warning to us, I think, that, that analogies are, are hard to, to fully grasp. They're so important in terms of what we do, and yet, at the level of policy, it's really tough. Tough. I happen to believe that with respect to Vietnam 1965, analogies probably didn't actually drive the policymaking to the extent that, that policymakers like to say, including Lyndon Johnson himself. Um, but that's a subject we can come back to. Your thoughts, questions, concerns? If not, I sure have others. <laughs> Well, can I just add one thing sure, on appeasement? Um, because it has a very bad reputation now. It's seen as weak need and, and hopeless. It is more complicated than that. And that's, historians are, are, we're always saying it's more complicated mm -hmm. than that. It's mm -hmm. one of the things we, we drive everyone crazy with. But appeasement was an honorable attempt to avoid another war. And no those those no who question. were making the policy had survived that war. They had often lost families. They'd been wounded themselves. Harold Macmillan, for example, who later became a prime minister, was a young cabinet minister, a young minister at the time, had been so badly wounded in the war that he hadn't been expected to live. And so you can understand why they wanted to avoid a war. And they weren't perhaps as foolish as they seemed, because in fact, Neville, even Neville Chamberlain, who I think was blind to many of the dangers of Hitler, was in fact stepping up British defense preparations. And I've often thought, in a way, that containment, which we see as a successful policy in, in which Soviet power was contained after the Second World War, was a form of appeasement that the United States rightly and its allies wanted to avoid war because an all-out nuclear war would have been catastrophic. But they did, in a sense, say to the Soviet Union, you can have what you want. They accepted Soviet, the Soviet empire in the center of Europe. And it's, sometimes it's the label we give them. Yeah, and, and, and just on that an analogy, it's just extraordinary the degree to which, as I think Margaret suggested, Munich became, and appeasement became a kind of political four-letter word in American political discourse for, for, for decades after mm -hmm. the 1930s, even though the United States was actually not a party to, to the agreement. Um, but it shows the power of, in this case, that Munich analogy in a negative form in American political discourse. Absolutely fascinating. Questions? Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Burney, Seminar 14. So, with regard to Syria and history informing current decisions, what anecdotes, what analogies, what questions would you apply from history that are most applicable to the decision to pull out of Syria? That is so difficult, I think, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 no one wins out of this. I think sometimes it is right for countries to say, we have invested a lot and we're not getting anything out of it. It's a very hard thing to say, because once you've spent a great deal, including, of course, I think most importantly, lives, it's very difficult to, to, to say that the whole thing has not been worth the effort. But I do think it's necessary sometimes, but it's how you leave and how you decide to, to, to pull out, I think, is also important. I mean, the, the tragedy of Syria is its geography and, and the nature of its population. It's geography because it's surrounded by people who don't wish it well. Um, Turkey, Russia, um, its neighbors, Iran, and its own population is deeply divided. And that it means that it's become a, a sort of um, playground, not playground, it's the wrong word, it's become a, a field for outside powers to meddle because they can find their proxies. 
and the people in the end, of course, who suffer are the ordinary Syrians um, who have, I mean, I think something like a third of the population are now refugees. And I think it's impossible to calculate how many have been killed and the damage done to that country. And it, it, it also, I think, warns us that conflicts take on their own momentum and that you can go in thinking this is going to be quick and easy. And it usually isn't. Um, and once a conflict starts, it's unpredictable. And I think Syria, it's going to be very hard to see how it ends. Um, so I have no, no words of wisdom at all. Sorry, but this is where historians aren't much help, perhaps. Well, except that I would say, uh, I think that what Margaret has just suggested is what historians can bring and should bring, need to bring to this, to this conversation. And you, I think she has articulated powerfully, to my mind, the importance of bearing in mind unintended consequences. And I, I just hope that the current president or other policymakers who are in these positions have people around them who will say uh, in, in greater depth than Margaret was able to say, but who, who speak those words that Margaret just gave us about these decisions so that you're not making critically important decisions on the basis of a phone call or on the basis of something that you in your gut feel is, is the right thing to do, but based on reflection, you have a sense of what it's like to come. Margaret used John Gaddis as a great example at the end of her remarks, that um, you know, it's the road sign that says there, could be, there, are, there are curves ahead, and that's what historians can bring. And so uh, I, I think you offered something important. It, it is true. The man for whom this auditorium is named in 1919, there was pressure on the United States to go into Syria, and Tasker Bliss advised President Wilson, don't do it, because there are three, as he saw it, three competing parties trying to control Syria, each of which desires to co-opt American power for their own ends, and that American interests in Syria were minimal. So if you're interested, I can point you the documents. Jeff has them at AHEC, uh, the letters that Tasker Bliss wrote to his wife saying I wouldn't touch this problem unless the president directly and in writing ordered me to do so. So there is a case where the United States looked at Syria and did step aside about a century ago. Good morning. Hi, Alexia Fields from Seminar 7. I'm very curious, the, you started to allude to something in reference to a council or a panel of historians, yeah. and I am really curious to the positives, negatives that you both have a opinion upon, please. Yeah, so I'll say just a little bit about this, and then uh, both Mike and Margaret should, should chime in. So this is a proposal, a serious proposal. If you're interested in reading further the, the, the argument in favor, um, Graham and Neil, that is to say Graham Allison and Neil Ferguson, laid out their argument for a council of historical advisors in the Atlantic uh, three or four years ago now, I think, um, and they argued for the creation, and they suggested, I think some, and certainly uh, with power, it seems to me, that having an entity like this in the White House, literally right there, to give a president long-term perspective, to give a president a, a sense of when analogies can matter, when they don't, the danger of analogizing, et cetera, can be really beneficial. Um, and they lay out the reasons for it, and I think they do a powerful job on this. The reason I'm a little bit skeptical is that I wonder if it would be better for existing agencies within the American government to emphasize and to put greater uh, emphasis on history and of having a historical uh, context and a historical understanding I worry a little bit that what they propose, I think they imagine a three-person council of historical advisors, which is very small uh, and depends obviously on which historians are placed on that council, for what purposes would they be placed on that council, is there a better way that we can bring history to bear on policymaking at the highest levels. I'm not sure myself that the council is the way to do it, but the thrust behind it the idea that we need to bring history more into the upper levels of decision making, it seems to me, is a really wise one. And so, as, a, as an experiment, uh, I think it could be a great way to go. I will just add one other thing, which is that at least going back to the Nixon administration, as far as I can see, maybe further, but at least since Nixon, 
there have been suggestions of this kind, that we need to have a historian's panel, council, body within the White House, uh, or at least uh, in the upper reaches, that should advise the president. So it's not a new idea. But I don't know if either of you want to. No, I, I think I rather agree with you. I mean, I'm not sure. You'd have to have people who'd be willing to listen to us. And I don't think every um, strategic leader sees the value of historians. But what I find worrying is in so many foreign services now, including my own country, Canada, there's been a move away from country and area expertise to issue expertise. And I think unless you know an area, unless you've lived there, unless you know its language, unless you've read its literature, unless you know something of its history, you don't understand that area. And so we run into the problem of assuming everyone's like us or, or making assumptions which are not founded, which I think does make it more difficult to deal with others. And I would like to see foreign services, people working in, in, in foreign ministries, I would like to see more of the country and regional expertise. I really think it's important. I can't imagine three historians we all know that could sit in a room and agree on almost anything. So it might just confuse people more than anything else. Uh, Commander Lancaster, Seminar 13. That was, that was weak. Um, so uh, you said you're writing on uh, President Kennedy's memoirs and uh, historical memoirs. And um, my question is, with Iran being on the threshold of, of testing a nuclear weapon and getting very close, um, what is your opinion on, from a historical perspective, historical mindedness, um, from an international stage, what should be done or what could be done um, or what should we be doing? Well, I. Um, I'm glad you got the simple question. Yeah, I. I, 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 I yeah. Yeah. No, that's a. It's a. It's a. It's a difficult question. I. I think myself, um, and I. I work at the Kennedy School and at Harvard with various people who are involved in negotiating the the Iran nuclear deal, who, by the way, represent people from both political parties, uh, various political perspectives. We have Republicans and Democrats uh, who were involved. Uh, in uh, that work, uh, my view is on the on the on the on the, with respect to that agreement, that it actually was a pretty good deal. Not perfect by any means, but that it had been negotiated over a long period of time by people who had really paid close attention to this, drew in part on historical knowledge and experience, to come up with a deal that they believe, and I've been persuaded um, by them. Uh, succeeded more than it failed, and it had real prospects. So in that respect, I think it was a mistake for the president to uh, go away from that deal. Um, but I think to, you know, you, you, you reference John F. Kennedy. I think Kennedy's, and goodness knows, and this will come through in my book, Kennedy made mistakes. Uh, it's ultimately a sympathetic portrayal of the 35th president that I'm going to give in these two volumes. He made policy mistakes. Uh, we could talk about the Bay of Pigs, for example, and we could talk about some of the, some of the negotiations with Khrushchev at Vienna and, and other decisions that they made. Vietnam, he bears a significant amount of responsibility for the, for the war in Vietnam. I argue on that mother of all counterfactuals, uh, what would he have done in Vietnam if he had survived? I argue that though we can never know, the best argument as far as I'm concerned is that John F. Kennedy, Kennedy would have avoided a large-scale war. We can discuss that. But I think with respect to this issue, um, Kennedy's understanding of history, and remember he had been sick a lot as a kid, which gave him few outlets except to do a lot of reading. That was basically the option you had in those days. And so he read a lot of especially British diplomatic and military history. But I think it gave him a feel for, as we've been discussing today, the unintended consequences, uh, the, the capriciousness of, 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 of developments. I suspect he would have been, on this issue, very careful. I think he would have respected what the Iranians themselves sought to achieve. Uh, I think he became acutely concerned in his short period as president about the problems of nuclear proliferation uh, and would have approached this, I think, with, with, with real care. I can't tell you, I don't know what he would have done in this specific case. Um, uh, but, but certainly he would have taken into account uh, what the regional implications w would have been for the Iranians getting nuclear weapons and what the Iranians themselves would have sought to uh, achieve with them.
True, Fred, he's one of the presidents that did surround himself with historians, that did kind of talk to people to gain advice. Yeah, Arthur Schlesinger was a kind of uh, in-house historian. How much he listened to Schlesinger in terms of making policy decisions uh, is, is another question. But one of the things that I, that I uh, admire and respect about Kennedy's uh, White House is the way that the advisory system worked. And this is an important distinction between Kennedy and Johnson. And one of the reasons why I think he would have acted differently ultimately with respect to Vietnam is that Kennedy welcomed contrary advice. This is clear. It's clear in the Cuban Missile Crisis deliberations. We have the White House tapes, which are an incredible resource, by the way. Those of you teaching should make use of, both with respect to Vietnam and Cuba, should make use of the tapes. It's, it's an extraordinary thing, and the Miller Center at UVA has done, a, I think, a, a magnificent job of making a lot of the tapes available for instructional use so that you can play the tapes in class, and the students will both hear the audio, and then they'll see the transcript on the screen so they can follow and, and listen at the same time. And what comes through, it seems to me, with respect to Kennedy, and especially on Cuba, is the degree to which he wanted to hear various perspectives. It also comes out, by the way, on Cuba, that he's really the only one in the XCOM deliberations during those 13 days who was insistent on the need for finding a political solution. I, I mentioned earlier that he had a, a, a capacity for empathy, so he also said in those meetings, we have to look at this from Khrushchev's perspective. We've got to put ourselves in Khrushchev's shoes. Doesn't mean we give in to him. In fact, uh, I would say that the Americans drove the hard, harder bargain, but it was critical in the outcome of that, of, that, um, of that crisis. And so, yes, Mike, I think that he, he surrounded himself with people who had historical understanding. Uh, he himself uh, had it. I think he could have been an academic if he hadn't pursued um, a political career. Wrote a book, uh, Why England Slept, to go back to appeasement for a minute in Chamberlain. Um, that I argue in volume one, actually, if you go back and read that book, which began life as a senior thesis, uh, class of 1940, actually holds up in some ways quite well in terms of explaining how British society in the mid-1930s, conditioned in part by the experience of the Somme and Passchendaele, was adamantly against another war, and that that constrained what policymakers, Baldwin, Chamberlain, could do, uh, that I think actually still holds power today. A young undergraduate who wrote um, uh, a senior thesis. Uh, Ryan Erler, uh, Seminar 20. I have a question for you about um, kind of balancing what you assess as moral righteousness versus, uh, versus political pragmatism. Uh, and this is kind of an opinion question, because I think most of us here join, and I, I apologize for using a horrible historical movie analogy, but we all join thinking we're going to be William Wallace. And by this point, I feel like we're probably a lot more like Robert the Bruce. Uh, and so, you know, how, how do you do that? And, um, you know, my example here is I spent a lot of time in Syria. Uh, you know, by 2014, I had thought Sykes-Pico was dead. Uh, and I was really excited to see where the world was going. And then we've spent a lot of blood, sweat, and tears stuffing the Middle East back into the Sykes-Pico box. Uh, and I'd love to see what your, what your thoughts are. Well, it seems to me you're asking two questions. One is how much morality should play a role in the formation of strategy, and that, I think, depends on the, the, the country or the people doing it. Um, I think for a lot of countries, their values are important. And there, there are many considerations. I mean, safety, defense, um, protection of what you have, um, all this matters. But I do think for, for certain countries at certain times, projecting what they think are values, which sometimes I think they hope will make the world a safer place. You know, this has been a constant theme in American foreign policy that if, if democracy spreads, the world will become a safer and, and more stable place. And so I think values, the morality in, in foreign policy often overlaps with, with very pragmatic considerations. It's, you can't always separate them out. In the case of Syria, um, you know, since that first question, I've been thinking about it. I mean, I think one of the problems perhaps with, with foreign intervention in Syria was that not only were there different players on the ground, I mean, it, it, who kept changing sides? I mean, if there's an historical analogy, it's the Thirty Years' War in Europe in the 17th century where 
people fought for 40 years and often ended up on very different sides than the ones they'd started on, and where you also had a social revolution and, and religious revolutions going on mixed up with outside interference and outright state-to-state -state war. And it seems to me that's what you were getting in Syria. What if, I think, powers are going to intervene in a complicated situation like that, I think they need to be very clear about what it is they're intervening for. And what is always, um, I think, a problem is, is that missions can start without clear purpose and can change. And sometimes that change is necessary. But sometimes the change is, is sort of an attempt to find another reason. I mean, I once counted up how many excuses the Canadian government gave for its intervention in Afghanistan. And it started out with, um, you know, determination to topple the Taliban, and it ended up with protecting women's rights. Um, you know, all of which are laudable excuses. But what are what were we there for? Um, I think is a reasonable question. As far as Sykes Pico goes, I mean, this is the, this was the arrangement that was made between the British and the French in the course of the First World War to divide up the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire to suit themselves. I think Sykes Pico is a bit of a red herring. Um, it was picked on by the opponents, by, by, by of course, the, the um, uh, Daesh, uh, ISIS, um, were going to undo Sykes-Picot. In fact, Sykes-Picot was a dead letter by the time the war ended, and the British and French made had adjusted it anyway. And a lot of the boundaries they drew in the Middle East were not, in fact, that unreasonable. The boundaries of Iraq are pretty much the boundaries of the three Ottoman provinces that went into making Iraq up. Um, Syria is another problem. The French detached what had traditionally been considered part of Syria and added it to Lebanon to make a stronger Lebanon, and that's caused problems ever since. But I think, and I've said this to, to people from the Middle East, I think sometimes people in the Middle East focus on Sykes-Picot as the source of all the problems in the Middle East, and it seems to me 100 years later there are many other sources of problems in the Middle East, some of them from within those Middle Eastern countries. You know, there is a tendency, and I can understand it given the amount of foreign interference has been, but there's a tendency in the Middle East to blame everything that goes wrong on outside forces. And a lot of the problems in the Middle East are to do with illegitimate governments, meddling by the military, um, you know, unwillingness of, of unscrupulous politicians to play up differences. And what I think is so interesting in the Middle East at the moment, and I think it's something we, we all need to really take account of, is that for all its troubles, Iraq is still a country it still holds together. Syria may, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen in Syria. Lebanon, there's been this extraordinary outpouring of demonstrations where people are saying, we want a Lebanon. And we want a Lebanon where we don't have a corrupt and, and inefficient government. And we want a Lebanon where we're all Lebanese. I mean, there was this extraordinary thing on the weekend where people held hands right down the length of Lebanon. And they were Shi, they were Sunni, they were Christian, they came from all political parties. And in Iraq, I think the, the demonstrations again are very interesting because they are showing a real willingness to have an Iraqi citizenship um, and keep those countries together. So, so I think as we look at the Middle East, goodness knows outside powers have done their best to make it an impossible place. I mean, they have used it as a playground to promote their own interests. And, and I include Iran in that. Um, Russia, Turkey, um, the European powers, the United States has, has pursued its own interests. And I don't think it has done on the whole the Middle East much good. But I think some of the if the Middle East is ever to become stable, it's going to have to come from within the Middle East itself. Sorry, so it's a rather long-winded answer to your two very good questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add this. Uh, the historian Arthur Link uh, referred to the higher realism of Woodrow Wilson. Uh, and what I think Link wanted to suggest was that Wilson sought in his own way, to go to your question, to combine a pragmatic approach to foreign policy with an emphasis on the morality, the moral righteousness of, in this case, perhaps American intervention in the war. And I, I, I'm often struck by that phrase, higher realism, and I think that, I think there is, as, when we write the history of American involvement in world affairs in the 20th century, I think there is something to the idea that, that America, a succession of American presidents following from Wilson, and this is one reason why Wilson, it seems to me, is such an important figure in the history of American foreign policy, and why all presidents, in, on some, in some way, I think you could say, model themselves on Wilson in terms of his approach. Uh, I think a, an attempt at that higher realism guided the, the nation's foreign policy, if I can put it that way, for the remainder of the century, 
mistakes of various kinds certainly occurred, some of them terrible mistakes. But there is something, it seems to me, and I'll speak for myself here, noble about what Americans sought to achieve, that it's not enough to describe American foreign policy as being purely self-interested in the decades that followed, that there was a sense uh, that we're also acting here on behalf of, if you will, humankind. It could get the United States into trouble to go back to Vietnam for just a, for just a moment. I think Lyndon Johnson really believed that he was that he was doing this for the Vietnamese themselves. Um, in in that crude formulation, inside every Vietnamese is an American trying to get out. But 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 you don't even have to put it in those terms. I think he believed that yes, he was taking the nation into war, yes, Vietnamese would be killed, but in fact, ultimately, this was for the benefit of the Vietnamese. So it didn't always have uh, positive outcomes, but I think, I guess what I'm suggesting is that marriage of pragmatism uh, and, and a sense of, of moral duty uh, has done a lot of good for American foreign policy and for the world. Good morning, Drew Deaton, Seminar 17. I have a two-part question for the panel, if I may. In the vein of historical mindedness and taking a long-term approach to policy and strategy, do you believe the U.S. has a true long-term grand strategy for interacting with and influencing other global powers? Or are we using an ad hoc short-term strategy approach like Graham Allison talked about in his book, Destined for War? And the second part of that, what are the implications of this against an expansionist power like China that clearly has a long-term approach to major issues as demonstrated by President Xi Jinping telling Japan once that they should, the two countries should set aside one of their interpower conflicts, quote unquote, for a generation to allow circumstances to develop and allow a more favorable condition to finding a solution to their differences. Well, I'm, I don't know how my co-panelists will feel about this or how the rest of you feel about this. I'm a little bit of a skeptic about grand strategy, I will say. Um, uh, yes, it's necessary for a nation or, a, or an entity, a corporation, to have to strategize, no question. But um, I, I'm dubious, I suppose, about what it gets us in the end. And so I think there is something to be said in, in, a, in a desire to be provocative up here on the panel for an ad hoc approach, for ad hocism, for taking, especially in a, in a complex world in which the United States does not, it seems to me, face existential, existential threats to its security, because with all due respect to Canadians and Mexicans, its, its immediate neighbors are not powerful. It's got the two oceans. Um, it seems to me that there is something to be said for an ad hoc approach to most international issues. And I think if you look back, both Republican and Democratic administrations, I would argue, have basically taken an ad hoc kind of approach while still, of course, having some strategic objectives. So that would be a, a, an answer to your first question. And I also wonder with respect to the question, second question, whether the Chinese themselves don't ultimately take a, a kind of ad hoc approach. Uh, that's, it's true that perhaps they think to some degree in longer terms uh, that's at least the idea we have about the Chinese. But I wonder if when it comes right down to it, Xi Jinping and his associates aren't uh, thinking very much in the near and medium term and making judgments accordingly. But I don't know what the two of you might say about this. Well, I agree on the grand strategy. I think it's um, a, a wonderful term, but what does it actually mean? And the whole point about strategy, I think, I mean, I'd, I'd like to sort of recover strategy from the way it's been used and have it deal really with this nexus, this, this interaction between the policy you hope to achieve and the conditions in which you have to achieve it. And I think it has to be ad hoc. I mean, you can have a long-term goal, but you have to be prepared to encounter difficulties or take slightly different paths to get to your goal. Um, as far as China goes, um, you know, I think there is a myth about China, which the Chinese themselves, of course, promulgate, but a lot of people are bought into that they are immensely wise and they think in terms of centuries and millennia, nobody else does. And I think this is complete nonsense. Um, I think the Chinese are as ad hoc as anyone else. And I think they are driven by um, 
to fashions and fads just as much as anyone else. And, and you know, this idea that Chinese foreign policy is enormously wise, the Chinese have managed to make enemies now of most of their neighbors, which doesn't seem to me to be wise. You know, the Japanese are seriously thinking of upping their defense expenditure, and, and I think they are seriously thinking now of acquiring nuclear weapons. The Vietnamese certainly are enraged at the Chinese. Um, the Philippines have good reason not to like them. India is very dodgy. Um, very, very um, tricky when it comes to China. And they, they fought a war in, you know, not all that long ago, and they still have unsettled border issues. And what I think is also happening to China, I mean, I think, it, you know, it's, it's what's always difficult is to figure out how strong the other per entity you are, you're dealing with. And the Chinese have been enormously successful with the One Belt, One Road initiative. And this, is, of course, is being portrayed as international friendship and harmony. My own view is they are running into exactly the same things, and this is where I think there is an historical analogy. A lot of European countries, including Britain, had East India companies in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries that went out to trade, and many of them very successfully, and they set up trading stations around the coast of places like India and China, and they were only there for the trade. They were only there for the profits, and then they found that if they wanted to be sure that the neighborhood in which they were living was secure, if they wanted to be sure that the things they wanted to sell, that they wanted to get from inside the India or China came safely, they had to have forces. And bit by bit, as someone said, like ink stains, these European settlements began to spread out to protect their original investment. And I think the Chinese are running into this now. Um, they have, I think, something like 100,000 or more, someone will know better than me, security people protecting a lot of their investments abroad. They, for example, have built that railway down to the port of Gwaidar in, in Baluchistan, in Pakistan. Baluchistan is not the most peaceful part of the world, and Chinese have already been killed there. They're having to put more and more security forces in, and so I think they're beginning to run into some of the same difficulties as the early European empires ran into, and they're beginning to get pushback. Um, you know, in parts of Africa now, the Chinese and, and, and their policies are complete, increasingly unpopular because what they will do is they'll deal with the local powerful people who will suddenly do very well out of this relationship, but locals aren't getting the employment and the Chinese are bringing in their own labor, often bringing in their, their own food supplies. And so it's interesting, I think. I mean, I think we, we need to look. I mean, there's this fear of the, the, the very clever, ancient, filled with ancient wisdom monolith of China. I think we need to look at it a bit more um, in a bit more of a nuanced way. We just had uh, the great historian Chen Zhen at Harvard, and Chen Zhen is writing a big biography of Zhou Enlai, and he was asked in the Q&A about Zhou Enlai's famous assertion when he was asked about, in, uh, in 1969, about what should we make of the French Revolution, uh, Zhou Enlai said, it's too, too soon to tell. And, and so Chen Zhen was asked, is that referring, in fact, to the French Revolution of, of, of the late 18th century? Oh, or is it the case that he was talking about the, the, the convulsions in Paris in 1968, the year before, and Chen Zhen, after some dramatic pause, basically said, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, I think Margaret's exactly right, that there is this sense that we have that the Chinese are thinking in, in terms of millennia and centuries. I don't think it's really true. Well, I think I don't know is a pretty good place to end. So uh, it falls to me, it falls to me to thank Margaret and Fred uh, to hope that you have a great first visit to Carlisle and to hope that it will not be your last. So you. you are released to seminar. Thank you all for your questions. <laughs>